there's a story about uh, the Renaissance painter Michelangelo, not, not the Teenage Ninja Mutant Turtle, but the, the painter Michelangelo. Honestly, I doubt the story's even true, but it serves a purpose. So the, the story is, is that when he did the sculpture of David, they said, you know, how did you do this? And he said, I looked deep into the marble and just removed everything that wasn't David. So the idea is I looked at this and started to take away wasn't there and what was left was him. And I, I mention that is because sometimes we have these, these pictures, <coughs> pictures of Christ that aren't very accurate. They're caricatures. You, y'all remember the caricatures you used to get done where they'd drawn, you know, and mine would have a nose like the panhandle of Florida or something. It, we have these pictures of Christ that aren't accurate. We see him as distant. We see him as angry. Or we see him as, you know, just this wandering teacher rather than the Son of God who came and lived in our place and died a death that we deserved and stands close to us when we are hurting. That's the picture that we're trying to reestablish. So as we go through this, we've been uh, reading Dane Ortland's uh, book, Gentle and Lowly, and working through this to try to, to try to come up with an accurate picture of who this Jesus is. Here's why that's so important. Here at Thrive, we are convinced that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. But saying that is one thing, recognizing, you knew I was in trouble. Thank you. (laughs) Man, I'll tell you what, I do so little, and there are so many other people here that that help to make sure that I don't just screw it all up. So I'm I'm thankful. We're convinced that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, that Jesus is the answer to the problems of the world. And when I say problems of the world, I'm talking about racial reconciliation, the struggles that we have both here and abroad, but not only both here and abroad, but the struggles that we deal with in our homes, the struggles that we deal with in our hearts. The answer isn't found in a get better program or a follow these steps, the answer is found in the person and work of Jesus. And if we can see him accurately and begin to mold our lives around him, it changes everything. And that's what we're all about. So if you have a Bible, would you open it to the fourth chapter of Hebrews? If you are unfamiliar with your Uh, Bible. Maybe you're you're new to that. Go to the New Testament and go closer to the end. You'll find the book of Hebrews. Now, I've got to give you a heads up. I'm going to do a little bit of heavy lifting this morning, but it's going to be worth it. It'll be it'll be worthwhile as we go through this uh, to give you some of the background so that this text we can see one thing. And it'll just be the heart of Christ, the way that he sympathizes. We're going to get into that. So the fourth chapter of Hebrews. Hebrews, the book of Hebrews, remember we we have no idea who wrote it, but we do know that it was written to a, a, a group of Hebrew, a group of Jewish Christians who were scattered abroad. So they're Jewish Christians who stuff is getting hard and they're considering leaving the faith. They're like, hey, it's I don't know if you've ever been there, but you're like, this is, life's just tough. What I'm trying is not working. That is who Hebrews is written to. And the author here in the the fourth chapter is trying to explain to them that there's a rest that they can have. There's a, a, a rest that comes in knowing Christ that's different than anything else in the world. Remember, God worked six days and then he rested on the seventh. That, that's, that was the pattern that he set up. And here through these, th- this, this part of chapter four, he's going to say this rest, you can actually enter into the rest of God. You can enter into the rest that he has uh, uh, to offer. It comes through Jesus. And he goes back and actually he, he refers to this old song that they used to sing. And their songbook, remember, is what we would call the Psalms. 
Psalm 95 is this incredible praise of, uh, where, where he just recounts how much God has done for him and how life is different because God has done what he's done. And then the author says something. That part was David. We do know who wrote Psalm 95. He says, today if you hear his voice, don't harden your hearts like your, your ancestors did. If you hear God speaking you, to you today, don't harden your heart like they did. You, you see, if you follow the, the way that the Exodus worked and the way that folks were heading to the promised land, God had said, you can have this rest. I'm going to set aside a land for you. And they ignored the word of God. And because they did, many of them fell to the sword. They didn't enter the rest and they died to the sword of the Amalekites. That's the, the way that that happened. So today, he's encouraging them and us today, pardon me, back then 2,000 years ago, and then us today, you can have this rest. And I don't know what's going on in your world. I know what goes on in mine. And rest isn't always the word that best describes it. Rest is something I need. Rest in, in Christ when, when I don't know how things are going to work out, when the anxiety kicks in, when the stress kicks in, when all of that is building up. I need this supernatural sort of rest that only God can offer. And that's what we're about to step into because genuine, deep, full rest is available for those who know Jesus is Lord. So, Hebrews chapter 4. I'm going to start in verse 12. For the word of God is living and effective and sharper than any double-edged sword, penetrating as far as the separation of soul and spirit, joint and marrow. It's able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. No creature is hidden from him, but all things are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we much, must give an account. Now, just be honest for a second. He talked about rest and then pulls this out. And you go, I don't know that that sounds much like rest. Uh, I don't know that, that that has anything to do with rest. Well, back up real quick, and he's going to get us there. Remember, the, the ancient Israelites, they ignored God's word, didn't enter rest, and fell to the sword. And here he's saying, hold on, the word of God is sharper than any two-edged sword. The word of God is sharper than anything you're going to face if you choose to ignore what he has for you. And he says, because God, the, the word of God actually, it, it lays our souls bare, doesn't it? If you're honest when you read scripture, man, it just peels you apart. And there is a God to whom you and I will give an account to one day. That's, he is holy. And you go, I thought we were talking about rest, right? What in the world does that have to do with rest? Well, remember, when we read our Bibles, we, we have it very nicely divided it up into, I, I think I just said divided it, that's only divided, pardon me, into chapters and verses. Uh, if you ever get to see the, or the, the old manuscripts, the way that it's written in Greek, it's, it's not broken up like that. It doesn't go chapter 11 and then chapter 12. It's simply writing. As a matter of fact, there's not even paragraph breaks. It just, it's, it's crazy to look at it and go, okay, how are we going to cipher this out? It starts and goes and goes and goes and goes. So it, we would be wrong to stop here because from here, from the reality that you and I will give an account, from the reality that God's word is sharper than any two-edged sword, he moves into verse 14. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast to our confession for we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in every way as we are, yet without sin. Therefore, let us approach the throne of grace with boldness, 
so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Okay, verse 14, therefore, what do you say whenever you, you come to your scriptures and it says, therefore? What's that there for, right? What's that there for? Okay, because God's word is living and active, because God's word is sharper than anything that we may avoid his word for to, to, to go and to follow our own because you and I will give an account, we have a high priest who's passed through the heavens. Wait, well, what's a priest do? A priest intercedes for the people. So a priest is the one who would stand in the gap between God and folks who had messed it up. That's what the priest would do. And he says, we have a, a great high priest. As a matter of fact, there's no other term. You read your whole Old Testament, you'll never refer to anyone as a great high priest. There's one great high priest. His name is Jesus. This great high priest who intercedes for his people. But the thing is, is the problem they had then is the high priest didn't live like they did. They lived in nice houses and they had money. And they had folks who attended them. They didn't deal with the problems that regular folks like us had to deal with. They lived a very secluded life, but not this great high priest. We have a great high priest who dealt with everything that you and I deal with. And it says he's passed through the heavens. In other words, he's, he's already won. He's sitting with God the Father. That is incredible. And we get from, and we, we, we rightly get this. The Bible tells us that Jesus is the visible image of the invisible God. He is the perfect representation of God to you and me. But don't miss that there's an inverse to that as well. Is that he is the perfect representation of us to God the Father. Not only did a perfect representation come to us, but you and I have someone who's like us and dealt with us sitting at the right hand, that place of power of God the Father, saying, I get it. I can sympathize with that. I've been there. I can understand. And that, that's one of those doctrines that I don't think we teach on well enough to realize that God knows and that he gets it. So from that, there are two oh, kind of uh, things that he gives us to do and one cause in the next verses. Uh, I've, I've, I've got to tell you, Dan saw my sermon earlier and he said, you've got two exhortations. Are you going to really tell people that they're exhortations? I was like, I don't know a better word to use. Two things we're supposed to do, okay? Two things we're supposed to do and the reason that we're supposed to do that, that come out of that 14 to 16. But I'm going to start with the cause, the reason for. Look at verse 15 again, or just hear it. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet without sin. Hey, folks, when the struggles pile on, I remember talking to a friend recently who said, I, 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 don't, I feel like I haven't got over the last gut punch, and now it's starting again. That, that when those sorts of things pile on, we tend to feel alone, don't we? We tend to feel isolated from the rest of the world. And even more so when we're struggling with sin habits. We tend to want to back away. We tend to, we go, what, what, how, how come I'm still dealing with this? Why, why am I so prone towards this? And we start to say, I don't belong with those folks anymore at the church. I need to be isolated. When the reality is, is that every one of us deals with those same feelings. Every one of us deal with the same sorts of struggles. Remember Adam and Eve in the garden. You know the story. They, they, they chose to not follow God's direction. As soon as that terrible event takes place, what did they do? They hid. 
They hid, and it was God that came looking for them. They hid, and you and I are no different. We do the same thing. I'm still dealing with this anger. I'm still dealing with this jealousy. My eyes still wander, and I wish they wouldn't. I'm still dealing with this after so long. Why, why, why does that happen? And what we do is we isolate, and we start to follow the pattern that, honestly, that Satan wants you to follow. And here we've just been told, we've just been told in the previous verses that, that everything is laid bare before God. Accounts will be settled before God. But the author here is reminding us that there is one who uh, is able to intercede for us, the great high priest, the one who stands in between us and God the Father. He gets it. He's able to, to sympathize. It's funny, as you and I hear the word sympath, sympathize and we think, oh, I, I feel bad for. But that's not what this word means. In the original language, it means co-suffer. It means to suffer alongside. So what he's telling us is, is that sin may want you to feel alone. Sin may get you to pull away and think you need to be alone. But the reality is, is that if you know Jesus is Lord, he's able to come alongside and suffer right along with you. And to say, I'm here. I get it. I understand. And you say, but how, how is it that he understands? Well, Scripture tells us he was tempted in every way just as we are. Now, it, 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 it's funny. If you go to any Bible college in America, uh, you see the freshmen, there's going to be a fight the first week because there's uh, some are going to line up and say uh, God foreordained everything and the other one's going to say no we have to make a choice that argument and then the other one argument that happens is is could Jesus sin and people are going to say well of course he could sin that's why he was tempted and others are going to say ah, ah, ah could God have failed well no he really couldn't and the reality is let me let me let you in on deep theological truth you will go nuts trying to figure that out. Somehow the truth, because the Bible teaches both are true. Somehow Jesus felt the full weight of sin, and yet there was no way God's plan was going to fail. That's the truth. And because he felt the full weight of sin, he can sympathize. As a matter of fact, uh, I, I would say he felt it even more there's a, it's in the book, C.S. Lewis made this great argument, um, you know, in the 1940s when he wrote Mere Christianity. It was, it was that he feels more, so if you picture, you know, standing out in the wind and the wind is getting stronger and stronger and you're fearing that the wind is going to blow you away, sooner or later, you're going to lay down to get out of the wind. You, you know, sooner or later, you're like, I can't take any more of this. I've got to go. Jesus never got out of the wind. So in other words, you and I never felt the full pull of it because we give in. He felt the full weight of sin because he never gave in. So can he understand? He understands more than you or I do because he stood up to all of it. He gets it more than you and I do because he never gave in. Make sure you get this when you see Jesus in your mind when you think about the Lord. He's not someone who's distanced. He's someone who can co-suffer because he gets what you're dealing with, regardless of what you're dealing with. And he not only gets what you're dealing with, he knows it more because he never gave in. This is an incredible Savior that we serve. We, 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 the, we need someone like him because he didn't sin, so he's able to pull us out. Picture um, if you and I are swimming and we're drowning. If we're both drowning, I can't rely on you to save me because you got the same problem I've got. But if there's someone who's outside of the water who's saying, I've already been through and made it safely, let me help you, I can rely on that one, not the one who's drowning next to me. 
So because we have a great high priest who can sympathize with our weakness, because he experienced that temptation yet without sin, we have this Jesus who not only feels it and suffers alongside us, but he is in a position to help. There's nothing like him. There's nothing like this, this Jesus. The more, the, uh, <laughs> we buy into it though, don't we? We buy into this fact that why am I still struggling with this? Or my family problems are unique, so, so I have to be alone. And the reality is this, is the more desperate our situation before the all-seeing eye of God, the closer he pulls, the closer he comes in, and the more wonderful his provision really is. So I'm begging you today, if you haven't seen Jesus right, see this sympathizing Savior for who he is. And if you don't know him as Lord, there is no reason to go another day. There is no reason to put off to tomorrow a choice that you need to make today. Tomorrow is not guaranteed. But he also says, Therefore, since we have a great, hang on, I've got, I got all excited and lost my place. <laughs> Isn't that the way that works? So let's go to the, the cause. Now, what do we do about that? There's two things he tells us to do. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the son of God, let us hold fast to our confession. He's the great high priest. We said that. He's already passed through the heavens. Now, uh, you got to step into their world a little bit if you're going to get that. Remember, Paul talks about uh, a fourth heaven. Or he, he talks, well, they, they see, or a third heaven, pardon me. He, heavens is, you know, the sky. If I look a little past that, I'll see the clouds. If I look a little past that at night, I'll see stars. If I look a little past that, that's where God is. That's the way that they were. That's the way that the Jewish mind works. So when he says he's passed through all that, he's completely left our realm and he is with God the Father. That's what he's saying. And he's saying because we have a great high priest, not one like the ones who can't sympathize, because he's passed through the heavens, because he is not just someone else, he's the very son of God, we need to cling to that confession. Cling on to that confession when, when stuff gets hard. Make sure to remember what, oh, I, I remember just being a little guy. When a little guy, when I uh, walked the aisle back in the day and went down and the preacher took me by the hand and he said, I want you to repeat after me. Jesus is the Christ, son of the living God. I confess him as Lord and Savior. That confession isn't something that we did simply then. It's something that we cling on to every single day. Martin Luther used to say, live your baptism. That's not something that happened just when I was eight years old. It's something I need to cling on to today, that he is Lord, because if he is Lord, I am not. And if he is Lord, neither are you. Jesus is Lord, so I have to identify my perspective and my intentions all around him and his kingdom. And sometimes, you know, it's, there's so much going on and so many struggles in life and so much gets piled onto our place. We tend to think, I've got to get this figured out. I have to get this figured out. I have to go through this one. And the first thing we need to remember is that Jesus is Lord. If he's Lord, I can sleep at night. If he's Lord, I don't have to beat myself to death worrying how this is going to work out. If he is Lord, I don't have to worry about who the next president is. If, I, if he is Lord, I don't have to worry about what happens in the government. If he is Lord, I don't have to have, worry so much about what happens in every aspect of life because I have a great high priest who can sympathize with our weakness. He's passed through the heavens. He's Jesus, the Son of God. You see, repeating ourselves, telling ourselves that over and over is how we begin to start to live that out. We cling to that in the difficulty. There's this, this incredible scene in Revelation chapter 5. Revelation 5, you don't need to turn there, I'm just going to summarize it, but there's this, this angel who's holding a scroll, you know, we, 
We try to figure out what all that's about. This angel holding a scroll and there's writing on the front and the back of it. And let me just give you the summarized version of that. That scroll is God's intentions to, uh, uh, for mankind. That's how God is going to work everything out. And they say, who's worthy to open the, the scroll? And there was no one. In other words, no one had the authority or the right to work out all of God's intentions for people. And you say, well, are you sure about that? Because John, who was watching it, John knew what was going on. He broke into tears when he realized there, there's no one who can do this. And the angel steps in and says, suck it up, buttercup. Hold on just a second. That's in the original Greek. And he says, hold on. He says, because look, there's the lion. Picture this. He says, there's a lion. John said, I looked up and I saw a lamb. It's Jesus. How is God going to work everything out? It's through Jesus. Who do you and I need to hold on to when life gets to be too much? It's Jesus. You hang on to that confession. Know that, not just here. Know it here. Because if you'll know it here, you'll know it here. That's if you want rest in the storms of life, cling on to the confession that Jesus is Christ, Son of the living God. He is our Savior. He's our Lord. But there's a second exhortation. He says, therefore, let us approach the throne of grace with boldness so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in time of need. Hang on, back up now. Look, look, look at what it is, is, is we have a great high priest who's passed through the heavens, who was tempted in every way, just as we are, except he didn't sin. He's Jesus, the Son of God. Therefore, since we build our lives around that confession that he is Lord, what's he say to do next? He says, you need to amp up your prayer life. You need to get comfortable coming to him over and over and over. We need to understand that as we're praying, we're coming to the, to the source of grace, to the source of mercy, to the source of genuine help. We're coming to the one who can sympathize with our weakness. When I say sympathize, what's that mean? who co-suffers alongside us, who comes along and says, I get it. That is incredible. See, the, this challenge to, to approach God's throne is an exhortation to persist. Hear me on this. You go, I've been praying for this for years. Keep it up. Keep it up. Keep praying, keep coming back, keep coming in and, and not hiding or trying to sugarcoat, sugarcoat the, the brokenness. Come and saying, God, I don't know why I still struggle with this, but I know that you're good and I know that you get it. And as we keep coming back, we'll, we'll begin to trust that confession more and more so that when he doesn't answer exactly as we want him to, because... I've been a Christian long enough to know that God doesn't always answer prayer the way I hope he does. But I know that he's one who co-suffers. I know that he's one who gets it. I know that he's alongside me. I know that he's Lord. I know that he wins. If that's the case, the way, the way he answers good enough. Go back to that picture of Michelangelo just taking away the extra stuff to, to be left with David. Our prayer is, is that as we go through these services, as we work through this, you'll begin to get rid of some of those false pictures of Jesus because he's better than you think. Start to see him for who he is. One who, who doesn't come up with an excuse for why you're messed up. One who comes alongside and suffers along with us. We hold fast to that confession. We confidently again and again and again go to him knowing that he's right. However, he answers. And there 
will find mercy. There will find grace. If you are in Christ, listen, this, this, I, I took this out of Ortland's book. He said, if you are in Christ, you have a friend who in, in your sorrow will never lob down a pep talk from heaven. He cannot bear to hold himself at a distance. Nothing can hold him back. His heart is too much bound up in yours. That's the Jesus that we sing to. That's the Jesus that we make the confession about. That's the Jesus that we wrap our lives around. See him for who he is. Would you pray with me? Lord, we repent of all the ways that we've secretly judged you by viewing you wrong. Help us to see you in bigger and brighter lights every day. Help us to see you as the God who comes alongside and says, I get it, and suffers with us. The one who provides grace and mercy, the one who gives us hope. Lord, we love you. Lord, you're incredible. Lord, we pray that as we sing and as we receive communion, as we even talk to each other here, that what happens here today would make you smile. In Jesus' name, and because he's awesome, amen.